This episode of The Body Serve is brought to you by Health IQ, an insurance agency that helps health conscious people like runners, vegans, weightlifters, and tennis players get lower rates on life insurance. 56% of Health IQ customers save between 4 and 33% on life insurance. To support the show and get your free quote, go to healthiq.com slash bodyserve or mention the promo code bodyserve when speaking with an agent. But I don't, I really don't have any regrets. I really don't. I've, I've lived exactly how I've wanted to. I've tried my hardest every single time. I didn't win the matches that maybe I should have always won. Or, but I really gave it my all. So that for me is enough. Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 111 of The Body Serve. I'm Jonathan. And I'm James. This is the first time we're coming to you since the conclusion of the Australian Open, which already feels like forever ago. We took a little bit of a a break. Well, it is kind of forever ago because we took a full two weeks off. And I kind of needed it. I thought I did too, but then after one week, I was like, well, we got to get one out. We got to get one out. <laughs> we were we were recording at such a, a pace before that it, it seemed like we were being delinquent almost. Yeah. So, you know, tennis marches on. We had a Davis Cup week, a Fed Cup week. But there was also a bunch of tournaments going on. But truly, the biggest story of this week, well, there are two huge stories. One The Fed Cup tie in Asheville, North Carolina, that saw Serena Williams play her first sanctioned match this year. The other big story is that Darko Gernkarov, a lot of tennis Twitter's woke bay, has been exposed as a catfish, (laughs) as a scammer. He's a fraud. The the timing of this is just perfect because it happened right before we were Mm -hmm. going to air were able to include it in this episode. Didn't have to have no special emergency episode. Right. So Ben Rothenberg released his story on Slate this evening, this afternoon. A, a lot of you have been following Darko for a while. He's been a Williams sisters stan. He's tweeted, uh, you know, in favor of LGBTQ rights, criticizing Margaret Court. And it turns out, like, Darko isn't real. He's a real person, it seems, but him as a potential ATP player is beyond wildly overstated. Yeah. The thing about him having a stroke and being in a coma for six months apparently is not true. Or likely to not be true. Right. We can't say that definitively, but we do know that someone calling himself Darko did try to lobby hard to get on Ellen and has been interviewed by real journalists, some of whom did not figure it out. Lord, this is... (laughs) You know what? Darko may have pulled the wool over our eyes with respect to his burgeoning (laughs) tennis career. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm here to tell you at the end of this episode... That there's lots to be learned and still taken from the Darko discourse. That's useful. (laughs) The Darko discourse. That's useful going forward. Yes. So we'll get to that a bit later. Uh, Just a bit of a rundown of what's going to be happening on the show. First, we will give you a recap of what's been going on in tennis, Fed Cup, Davis Cup, Petrik Vidova, everything. The kind of the centerpiece of this episode is an interview with our friend and body serve listener, Chad who you may know as uh, at ccsmooth13 on Twitter, who was lucky enough to be at the Fed Cup tie in Asheville in person and sit very close to the queen herself, Jill Smoller. Mm -hmm. I mean, Serena Williams. (laughs) (laughs) And then we're going to circle back to Darko at the end. Yeah, so Davis Cup happened. Fed Cup happened, and uh, a few smaller tournaments, Mm -hmm. right? Where do you want to start? Let's Let's, start with Petra. Yeah, because this was last week now. So, or two weeks ago, Petra Kvitova, you know how she goes on these runs, right? Mm -hmm. Like, she just gets hot. And when she is on a hot streak, she's untouchable. Like, it's not even close. So, Petra won the title in St. Petersburg, which also saw Kiki Mladenovic kind of get a little bit of her fire back. She won three matches, made it to the final. 
Uh, and she beat quality competition. She beat Sibolkova, Siniakova, and Kazatkina. It wasn't just getting some of her mojo back. It was winning a match. Y- right. Because that's something that she hadn't done for damn near six months. Uh, right? It was like a 15... Fif- 15 tournaments? Yeah. Yeah. And she won the doubles title in Australia. Mm-hmm. Grand Slam champion to start the year in doubles. We speculated whether that would push her forward to maybe translate some of that success into her singles, and she did. Maybe the familiarity of having won that tournament last year, good feelings, good vibes, but there she was in St. Petersburg. Mm-hmm. And if hey, I- just dropping that in, her doubles partner, Tamea Babosh, won the title in Taipei City mm. as well. So you have a finalist and a titleist from this doubles team already. But Petra really did the business in St. Petersburg. She was able to parlay that success into Fed Cup the following week as well, where the Czech team beat Switzerland 3-1, and she scored two singles wins. They were at home in Prague. It's Petra's first Fed Cup tie since her attack. She hasn't represented Czech Republic since she's come back. And, I mean, she has been a Fed Cup stalwart for years She is damn near untouchable when she's playing Fed Cup. And Czech Republic is by far the best Fed Cup team in the world. Their bench is so deep. They've won five of the last seven. They, I mean, when their top players are playing, it's, it's over. Like no one else has a chance. Elsewhere in Fed Cup, the doubles team of Ash Barty and Casey Delacqua, they clinched for Australia over Ukraine on grass. Barty won both singles matches. Conversely, Daria Gavrilova lost both singles matches. Uh, unfortunately, one to Marta Kostyuk, who's 15 years old. I mean, that's a huge win for her. Barty Delacqua, as you said, clinched the tie. They won the fifth rubber. I was watching a stream of the Fed Cup tie, and they were talking about how Ash Barty is going to be teaming up with Colleen Vandeweghe as a more regular doubles partner because Casey doesn't travel to every tournament. I was a little disturbed by it. And then I thought about it. And could they be unbeatable? Two serves like that. Well, from a doubles perspective, from a sheer talent and uh, the way they'll work together perspective, it makes great sense. Colleen has been kind of flailing in the wind without a regular doubles partner for a while. After Santina broke up, she joined Martina Hingis briefly. We saw her in Cincinnati with Martina when that happened. And she's been kind of cycling through partners up until now. And maybe this is the perfect kind of scenario for her where she doesn't have the pressure of playing with somebody week in, week out having to keep a full doubles and singles schedule. Mm-hmm. Since she's a top 10, well, was a top 10 player, she's in the in the top echelon of the game now in singles. Uh, so, yeah, it, right. it, it could work out well for both of them. I just hope uh, as a, a young, impressionable lass <laughs> that Ash takes the teachings of Casey <laughs> with her on uh, the road. She definitely will. I mean, personality-wise, they're obviously quite different and I, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing i i'm curious to see just how they gel as a team because ash has such a deep connection with casey delacqua obviously no one's going to replace her but i wonder if uh if that's something she's looking for in a doubles partner elsewhere in montpellier montpellier you know i was looking at the results and i was like you know joe sanga has just got these small Western European tournaments on lock. Any any tournament in like the ancient Roman colony of Gaul, Joe's got it. He's going to win it. Most spe- more specifically with this tournament, though, every year it's like, well, which Frenchie is going to going to win it? Yes, he was. He made it to the semifinals versus Luca Puy, and sustained an injury. And kind of hobbled off court. And Luca even carried his backs for him. Well, he should. Joe was well, a stone's throw from winning that match. <laughs> right. Puy beat Gasquet in the final. Estrella Burgos won Quito for three times, right? Yes. Three times in a row. He was a three-time defending champion, won his first match. So he had a 16-match win streak, which ended up being 
snapped by Gerald Melzer of Austria. A qualifier went on to win that tournament for his first ATP title, Roberto Carballes Baena. How did I do? Pretty good. <laughs> he beat Albert Ramos Vignolas, which has to be considered an upset. Another qualifier won his first ATP title in Sofia, which unfortunately for Grigor Dimitrov, he had to pull out of his kind of his hometown tournament. Mirza Bozic uh, beat Stan Wawrinka in the semifinals and Kopil in the final. Stan took Grigor's spot when he pulled out. Mm. And for Stan to battle through a few matches and get to the semifinal is a, a really good result for him, all things considered. Because mm -hmm. as he said, what's really important for him right now is to get the match play. And he was able to do that this week. Yeah. There's really no rhyme or reason to the, to the rundown. We're just kind of no. giving you bits and pieces of what happened. <laughs> <laughs> so what had happened was Davis Cup was the previous week. There were a few notable results that I felt warranted a mention. Germany defeated Australia 3-1. This was not a foregone conclusion before the tie. But Sasha Zverev got two very big wins to reverse some pretty bad momentum he had going into this tie. He won a five-set match, which is unusual, against Alex Dimenauer, who, who's been on fire lately. I watched the fifth set of that match, and it was impressive for him specifically because Dimenauer went up a break in that fifth set. Yeah. And so Zverev had to come back. Uh, we, we subsequently find out that Dimenauer was playing with some kind of cracked rib or broken something. Oh. Some strain of, of sort. He was injured in mm. that fifth set. Uh, but still, Zverev, it's a type of win, and it's cliche, and it's the type of narrative that's overwrought and overused, but it's a type of win that could help him going forward. And he also beat his contemporary Nick Kyrgios in, three, in straight sets. Elsewhere in Davis Cup, Spain faced Great Britain, and Great Britain, this day and age, really shouldn't threaten Spain at all. But Cam Nori got a huge come-from-behind win in five sets over Roberto Batista Augut, and Great Britain went wild. Judy Murray was out here talking about it. I mean, people were really excited. And Nori really kind of came out of nowhere. There's really no reason he should have pulled that off, but well, sometimes this happens in Davis Cup. Nori, like Diminar, was entering Davis Cup on the back of a lot of strong results on the lower circuits. Mm, yeah. Nori had an incredible end to last year. And so while his profile isn't that high, it's uh it's encouraging for him. Great Britain, Andy Murray's out, Kyle Edmund I I believe he wasn't able to play. And here we have Cam Nori now mm -hmm. stepping up. Like the Davis Cup for Great Britain and the strength of their team is looking a lot better. It is, because Aljaz Bedene was never able to play. He's back playing for Slovenia. Dan Evans obviously is not playing. He's undergoing a ban. So they've managed to, to put together a team. Now on the other end of the spectrum, France, the French Davis Cup is the deepest Davis Cup team in the world. I mean, they just have a wealth of players to put out there. They have a lot of players who are comfortably in the 10 to 20 range for the majority of their career. Right. And this is without Monfils because he has fallen out with the French Federation and Yannick Noah. It's without Songa, who wasn't playing. Puy did not even play a singles match. They won convincingly against Netherlands with Mahu and Hugues Herbert in doubles and Gasquet and Manorino in singles. But when you look at the people they could have played, there's also Benoit Paire, Julien Beneteau, Gilles Simon. Like, it goes on and on. There's so many French guys in the top 100. And uh, it's just good to see the defending champion get through that first round. Croatia beat Canada 3-1. Borna Cioric, he scored two singles wins over Shapovalov and Pospisil. Mm -hmm. Mr. Pospisil who was one of my picks for comeback player, 
<laughs> just like to throw that in every now and then when my <laughs> when my picks start to play mm-hmm. well, right? He left Davis Cup and has subsequently won two challengers in a row. In Rennes and Budapest. And Vasek, poor thing, was coughing. He's a little bit sick in Budapest and he still won. Let's introduce Chad right now. We are so excited to welcome back our friend Chad to the podcast. I know a lot of you were just really craving his southern stylings. His voice really excites, you know, many of you, mostly me. Uh, (laughs) So Chad was in Asheville, North Carolina, watching the Fed Cup tie at USA versus the Netherlands. And we asked him on to talk about it. The smooth operator. So Chad, how are you doing? First, that was a perfect intro. I loved it. <laughs> and anything with today references, thumbs up. But I'm good. I'm good. I am just chilling right now. Just poured me a nice cocktail. And I'm watching Donald Young play someone on the Tennis Channel. Some... <laughs> and doing you guys. So that's cool. Awesome. You had kind of a a, a dream weekend, really. How much money would you have paid in advance to get what you got? (laughs) You got (laughs) Venus Williams winning two singles matches at Fed Cup. And then you got to see the Williams sisters play doubles together. And you got to see Olympia. You got to see Jill. You got to see and talk to Alexis. Talk to Isha again. You're you're a Williams family member at this point. (laughs) That, it was it was incredible. I mean, when the news came out that Serena and Venus were going to be in Asheville, um, I happened, it was one of those days that I didn't follow my routine. I just sort of came home. Um, instead of going to the gym right after work, I saw the news, and I got right online and scooped up two tickets. And then 10 minutes later, they were pretty much jacked up to like $1,000 or almost gone. So it was kind of an incredible kind of experience. I never, I didn't think about going to Asheville, even though I knew Fed Cup was going to be there, because I thought it would have been not Venus and Serena. Um, but it, but it was incredible. It was a great experience. So why don't you um, set the scene? You know, what is, what's the venue like? What was the atmosphere going into the tie? Because it seemed to me that, given the history of the Williams sisters not feeling as appreciated on home soil that this crowd was absolutely there for them the entire time. Yeah, I went, so I went up on Thursday and it was promoted as an open practice the team um, for the public to come in and watch the team practice. Um, So the public was in line. I was actually there about an hour before and the line was pretty much extending, you know, the whole time. But people got in and realized that for two hours, instead of Team USA, we saw Coco. (laughs) Instead of Team USA? Is she not on Team USA? (laughs) She is, you know, but, but, and and, and I think a lot of folks kind of enjoyed that because they may not have been to a tennis kind of thing before. Um, So they enjoyed watching it, but they kept waiting for Serena and Venus to come out. Mm Mm-hmm. So the draw itself was open to the public and the line was even longer on Friday when that took place. And that's when we got our Venus and Serena fix. Um, they came in, they talked um, the entire time. And Venus was the instigator. I mean, I want to blame Serena a lot of times for instigating those chats, but Venus kept on and Serena was trying to be attentive and and smile and and grin when her name was brought up but venus kept like chatting with her the entire time it was it was just incredible i mean i I didn't even realize anybody else was out there except for those two but on saturday and sunday is when the the matches were and venus came out to play in the first match and the crowd it really wasn't a match it was hit and miss there were moments that venus looked great and then moments that venus sort of just like coasted um the first time that the actual crowd got really into it um was when coco came out really oh i guess that north carolina crowd is a little bit different (laughs) well okay so let me let me let me clarify a little bit okay so when they first all came out on the on the floor 
folks were just, I mean, they loved him. I mean, but Venus's match was just tough to get into. Mm. Um, Coco's match was a little more dramatic. I mean, you had somebody from the U.S. who folks came there to root for. I mean, had the flags out, wearing outfits, um, costumes, all types of things, noisemakers. And Coco was down, I think, 3 love in the second. And that's when she started smashing her racket. She was also jacking and, up the crowd as well, too, right? She was playing into the crowd? Yeah, she was. She was, like, pumping up. I mean, like, raising her hands she, like she does. Um, and it's it's awkward. I mean, it really is awkward. I mean, I, the crowd was very supportive of her. I don't know if the crowd really knew Coco's history. Um, the lady behind me, a few people behind me, actually said they love to see her get riled up. That that's when she plays her best. They said that they really think that hotheads make the game more fun. And it kind of makes you cringe to hear that, knowing as a tennis fan, knowing what Coco does and has said and how she's been to her opponent, our opponents. Um, so it was just kind of, it was kind of tough and difficult to um, digest. But the crowd was very supportive of her. She calmed down, I guess, as she got, you know, more comfortable in that third set and she won. But I will say at the same time, people, you, the murmur throughout the crowd was about Serena. Now, you had really good seats, judging by your photographs, and you were pretty close to the players at certain points. Um, what was it like watching Serena sitting on the sidelines interacting with the team? I sat on the, I, I was literally a section beside Serena. Um, and then I wound up being a row behind Serena. <laughs> and as much as I've, I've, I've seen Serena play, I think, three times. I've seen Venus play a, a few more times than that. Um, but it still is sort of overwhelming. I feel like I get shallow breathing going on, a little shakiness. And I, I, I knew I was sweating, but I didn't know what to do to stop it. So <laughs> it was, <laughs> I know, right? It was pretty overwhelming, um, but it was but it was incredible. I mean, she Serena was the ultimate team player. I mean, she was sitting there talking with Shelby Rogers. She was talking with Lauren Davis, and probably a lot of that is to make them comfortable too, being around her. But she was a, a great example of a team player sitting on the bench, even though I know folks wanted her out there playing singles. There was a lot going on because I remember watching and seeing Serena talking to Lauren Davis and you're paying attention to that in the forefront of the shot and right behind <laughs> there's Alexis feeding Olympia <laughs> and she's, what should I be paying attention to here Serena talking to Lauren uh the star of the show Olympia or Venus trying to play some tennis so Lauren was not the star <laughs> <laughs> disclaimer <laughs> I, Disclaimer to the listeners, <laughs> Chad is a huge Lauren Davis fan. And that's, that's a whole other conversation. But <laughs> I um, yeah, that's a whole other conversation. No, I mean, it was like a side show. And I don't, it was nobody's fault, per se. It's just so much attention is given to Serena, to Alexis, to, the, to, to Olympia, who has just stole the show with a bunch of those pictures um, during the Fed Cup. Um, and also, Jill was there. You had Isha there. It was um, also security was just beeped up. You could see security more so in that Serena corner than you could anywhere else in the stadium. It was the venue security plus Serena's security. Did you hear Olympia make a peep the entire time? I hate to admit it. I did not see or, or get to see Olympia other than through pictures because she was sort of in front of me on Alexis's lap. Okay. But she, she was the quietest child. I mean, we didn't hear anything from her at all. I went over to speak to, I went to speak to Isha and Isha just basically said she was the most amazing child ever. I mean, just, just nothing but complimentary. <laughs> so let's dive in because you just dropped that in there that you talked to Isha Price. So we know you've met Venus a few times uh, at like fan yeah. events at the U.S. Open this year, but you have an uncanny ability to just walk up to people and introduce yourself and start talking. Is Richard the only Williams member that you haven't chatted to? I've met Richard, and I oh, went up see, to there. You go. <laughs> 
let's see, what year was that that I met Richard? It was about, it wasn't this past Charleston. It was um, 2016 Charleston that I went up to Richard and talked with him. Um, and he was very pleasant. He was very involved with the match. He told me he couldn't sit down to watch Venus play, that he was just too nervous. Um, and this is after, what, 20 years of Venus being on the tour. He is still too nervous to sit down, that he has to wander around the stadium to go to different areas to watch it, <laughs> which is just you know, kind of cool to me to know that. So what is your question, James? <laughs> oh, well, the question is, I just wanted to tell us a little bit of the gossip. You know, we talked to Isha, Alexis, Ohanian. What were they saying? <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm, okay, so Isha was just totally cool. She remembered me when I went up to her. Um, I was I went up to her to introduce myself, and she stopped me midstream to sort of tell me, I know who you are. And, <laughs> you, I mean, that's just, that's just bizarre to me to feel that way because, no, Isha, I know who you are. You're not supposed to know me. And, you know, but she was totally cool. She makes, she made me, like, when I went to meet Venice in New York, she totally made me relaxed when I was around her and did that with, I guess, the crowd who came in. And she just has that ability about her. She did the same thing here. But she said, she pretty much stopped me midstream and said, no, I remember you from Cincy in New York. And, and I was a row or two behind, but I was standing over chairs. So basically I just asked are you coming to miami and she said yeah i'll be in miami she said we have to get another selfie then to add to the collection which i thought was <laughs> just kind of that was so fucking cool i'm sorry that was so fucking cool for her to say that um <laughs> later on I met alexis and <laughs> alexis is a charming a charming dude <laughs> I, I, I've never... <laughs> it feels like you're holding something back yeah, here Chad. <laughs> What are you getting at? <laughs> he is a, a no, six foot I four never, glass I've of water. I've never found the appeal of Alexis. I've never found the appeal of Alexis. And I'm not saying that's not a negative comment. It's just my personal kind of opinion. Well, but I, when I met him, it was different. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, he is very personable. He is, you know, over six foot, like three or four or five or something to that effect. Um, he give, he just gives this amazing eye contact, um, but just very personable, very chatty. I think the whole time that I was there, I saw Alexis talking to folks on the regular. I mean, that's a great thing, but I can see the charisma. It's sort of where I think I'm hmm. trying to go. More, more charisma in person than I think I have um, witnessed any other place. Something I saw on Twitter was a lot of folks in the Rena's army saying that Serena better be watching her back because Alexis is out here talking to everybody <laughs> in these <laughs> Fed Cup streets to the extent that the whole point of it was that, you know, there are all these groupies that are going to be coming out for him now. He, I mean, like, he was very chatty. He talked, but I don't think it was exclusive to any particular group of people. I don't think it was just exclusive to the females or males. I think that he gave good attention to folks that came, approached him to talk to him. I mean, regardless of who they were. Um, so I know I saw a tweet by, um, by Bree uh, for the tennis and pretty much I said, I mean, it definitely was obvious that he is just chatting, chatting away the whole time. And Serena is so used to it. She's just kicked back, chilling in her chair. She sees it. <laughs> She's not worried about it one bit. She kind of tosses her hair aside. She looks back. She rolls her eyes. And then she starts talking to Lauren Davis again. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she's Serena Williams. Like, where is he going? If Serena isn't bothered, why are you bothered? Right. You know? <laughs> and so other than that, he talked about, you know, some of the nightlife type of stuff. I mean, he said he had been to Asheville before. He was thinking about getting some beer. He was looking for some good breweries. I sent him, you know, a tweet that kind of suggested a brewery. Um, but just a very relaxed vibe from that whole um, that whole section in the arena. I mean, Jill, I met her along with um, a few people from Twitter who actually sort of introduced me to her. Oh. Um, and some... You, 
And she was so freaking chill. I mean, she was just cool. She's the one that invited folks, a few guys, um, and also um, a few folks from Twitter to sit behind Serena. Wow. So Jill knows yeah, army she, people, like, personally? She knew, she saw someone's tweet in the arena, um, and she DM'd the person <laughs> to come down and sit in the row behind Serena. That is so classy. That's crazy. Yeah. And Bree and I, and we follow, I mean, it's Ghetto Rapunzel um, mm. on Twitter. And so he went down and they had just driven from Charlotte for the day to hopefully just be able to see Serena and Venus. And for them to sit in the row behind Serena, out, and they motioned for me to come over and I went over they were still shaking. I mean, they were trying to keep their cool because, I mean, you can't really be demonstrative behind Serena Williams. Or they're going to call in security. Right, right. The security (laughs) was still right there. So, Wait, so you got to sit with them? Yeah, so I went over and I sat right behind um, Serena, Lauren Davis, and Shelby Rogers. Wow. So that was pretty fucking cool. (laughs) Were they talking shit about Coco? (laughs) <laughs> let's see was this so i went over there yeah it was during coco's match um serena was once again pretty supportive i think serena was sort of a follower with clapping so when she saw other people clapping for what coco did she would start clapping as sort of a, a teammate to show her support <laughs> all right so let's talk about the tennis for a little while um like we said you have been a venus fan for a long long time uh, but I kind of want to get an idea how you felt Venus played in both of her matches. She clinched on Sunday in the third match. Uh, you know, what was your feeling? I think Venus's play in the first match, her first set was pretty strong. The second set was pretty raggedy. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, I, I think that was to be sort of expected. Venus hasn't had much match play this year. Um, not since actually Singapore. I mean, she lost to Kerber and then she lost to Benchik in the Australian Open, you know, the first round. So, but for her to get through that match, come back the next day and be pretty impressive um, against a um, pretty strong competitor from the Netherlands and to wrap it up and win the tie. Also, that was her 1,000th match played, I believe, and 1,001 on Sunday. It was pretty damn impressive. I've followed her since since she began. My first tournament seeing her was in 99 in Madison Square Garden. So it's sort of full circle here for her to still be doing this 20 years later. Um, it was pretty amazing. And to see her win the tie and, you know, I wanted her to carry the flag so I could get, like, a great picture. But Lauren Davis carried the flag. Listen, your pictures <laughs> from this Fed Cup need to be seen Mm -hmm. and can you plug his instagram right now? so we're gonna link to it when we post the episode but follow at cc snaps 13 uh because chad's pictures are lit right now new camera he's always got a good seat he's sitting behind jill and serena please check it out Uh, now i'm gonna tell you chad some of these pictures were so good they were so memeable if if I may say that, that maybe I'll be doing something with them in the future, but I will be crediting you on social media. Mm-hmm. I will not be one of those hoes in these streets. <laughs> you don't have to say anything. No, I mean, that I, I appreciate it. I mean, that was sort of my goal this year was to just get a, a camera, a nice professional camera to take better pictures. And I'm, it was my first sort of tennis tournament doing that. My hope, my plan was to be ready for Miami because I'm going to Miami. But when Venus and Serena announced they would be playing, I I, I was just trying to do my best, and I appreciate the shout-out. Thanks, guys. So let's just get back to tennis for a second. I have a question. Can I ask? Of course. Okay. So I didn't really... I mean, I expected Venus to win both those matches, right? On paper, on ranking, whatever, fine. She wins both of them in straight sets. But within the match, we, we James just asked you about how she was playing. The thing that I want to know most about is what her serve looked like. And it seemed to me that, especially in the 
well, she didn't serve well in the doubles, <laughs> from what I gather. But there were moments where the speed on her first serve was pretty good. Was that the case? Yeah, I mean, it was. It was better, I think, in the second match. I think her winners were. I mean, her winners were much better, higher than her error count in the um, second match. And I think that's a credit to her serving better. When she serves better, she's just more confident. Her forehand's stronger. You could see the improvement from day one to day two. Um, it was a, a person who was more game in that she was playing, and um, and Venus rose to the occasion. She didn't get rattled. She didn't double fault into the net. You know, she didn't let her head drop too quickly, um, like she sometimes does on that second serve. It just it was kind of a, a huge improvement to me, um, Jonathan, from day one to day two with the serve. Now, if you could be so kind to take us through what happened after Venus clinched the tie and then when they made the announcement that Venus and Serena were playing doubles. What was that like? Because it seemed like nobody knew who was going to be playing doubles or even if there was going to be a doubles match. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, that's correct. I think, I mean, I had a few folks around me asking different things. I wasn't really sure. I don't, and I was actually sitting by Bree at this point. We were sitting together on that second day, which was pretty cool. And I don't think we knew exactly if they would even play any more after that, that third match. Um, there had been disappointment in the crowd, a little disappointment because folks want to see Venus and Serena. They want, I mean, and Serena had the most buzz. You know, there were more media folks there for Serena. Um, and they wanted to see her play. After Venus did what she needed to do to win, there was sort of a buzz going through the crowd that this is going to be it. We're not going to see Serena. They're, she's not going to come back out and play with Lauren Davis in the fifth match. They're not doing this. Um, Venus is going to win and wrap it up, and that's going to be it. So actually some folks started leaving, you know, after Venus won. Um which I thought just was too bizarre. I mean, you'd sit there and watch the rest of her press, you know, her being interviewed on the court. But most stayed, and when the announcement came out, there was there was this hush for like just a few seconds, and then a roar. It was like, did we hear that correctly? Did I hear that? And then everybody kind of confirmed with these huge roars that that they were just excited to see Serena and Venus out there together. So, what was your impression of the match? <laughs> it's weird because, but, <laughs> because being there being there is just a different feeling for me because just to be in the presence of Serena and Venus all weekend was overwhelming in itself for me to hear that they were just going to be stepping on the doubles I mean the court together as a, a, as a doubles team was almost surreal I've never seen them play doubles together I didn't think I'd ever see them play doubles together. I don't think they played a Fed Cup tie in doubles since 2003. Um, and for that to happen, I could give a shit about the quality of the match, to be honest. <laughs> I really could. I mean, I, 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 you know, I, did, I don't expect Serena to come out there and play like she just won the Australian Open last year. I don't expect Venus to be super superhuman, you know, right after finishing a match to clinch the tie. What I saw is Serena was rusty. That was fine. I'm glad to see her back out there. I can't wait to see her more. I think Venus was sort of overcompensating to try to cover for her because she didn't want Serena to come out there and lose in her first match back. And it just wasn't a pretty match. Mm. Well, that's what big sisters do, and that's what Venus has done for a long time, right? Protect her little sister. Yeah, and, and after the match, you could see that even, that they lost and that Venus was not happy about it. Serena was trying to actually make her smile about it, it seemed like, on the <laughs> sideline. Um, but, but Venus was not feeling it. She wanted to go out there and let Serena get that moment, mm -hmm. I think. That's how I felt. I think that kind of brings us to the end of the Fed Cup segment. Let's take a little break to talk about our sponsor, Health IQ. 
I mentioned earlier that their specialty is getting better rates for health conscious people. And the way they do that is they work with 30 plus top rated insurance carriers, all A and A plus carriers, and use analytics that go beyond simply age and gender and look at your physical activity and the way that you live your life and hopefully get you better rates on life insurance. The way it works is that you can either go online, take a quiz that proves that you are health conscious in your chosen field, be it tennis, weightlifting, running, etc. Or you can use several apps to kind of log your progress, show evidence of working out, races, yoga, all these things. And in doing so, you can unlock the better rates for your life insurance. So to support us and to get your free quote, please go to healthiq.com slash bodyserve or mention bodyserve when you talk to an agent. There's a bit of breaking news, Chad. Yeah, before you go, we got to talk about something. Because <laughs> we're like, well, we'll add it to the show, but we thought to ourselves, who better than to talk about this story with than Chad? Because we've DM'd about this thing <laughs> so many times over the last few months. All right. So Ben Rothenberg's story about Darko Gernkarov came out this afternoon. And, uh, you know, the three of us have mused for quite a long time. And you were really, you, Chad, were the Darko truther. You, you did not believe yeah. that this person was real, right? Well, to be clear, both of us were kind of like, okay. Because not, we, didn't, we didn't drink the Kool-Aid. Okay. <laughs> but Chad, from the start, to give him credit, was like, girl. And we were like, well, you know, he says he was in a coma. What if he was? You know, <laughs> won't you feel bad, Chad? So you made me feel guilty to believe in this man. (laughs) (laughs) Because at first, okay, so I will say one of the reasons I didn't really, his tweets were over the top, but they were over the top perfect in a lot of ways. Mm. And I'm a huge Venus fan, of course. And even um, I was told that that sounded like me in disguise tweeting those things about Venus. (laughs) It's was that Brie? It's like if I had, if I had, yes. And if I had freedom <laughs> to just tweet about Venus, I could talk about how wonderful and immaculate she is and people applaud me and that would be the reward. <laughs> and, and that's sort of what he did. And, but I did feel a little guilty for thinking, okay, what if I'm wrong? But it just seemed all too suspect. And we talked about his Instagram page. We talked about, um, you know, his, uh, his pictures on Twitter and his videos. It just, they just seemed um, blurry. Right. Like they were never up close or they were in the dark. Even that uh, he released that video of him singing a song and playing guitar. Like, who was that? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I forgot about that, James. That just happened. It did. (laughs) What can this man not do? Exactly, exactly, right? Yeah, so, I mean... I thought you were going to say that the reason why you were most suspicious of him was because of your pedigree as InstaThought champion. You could tell what was real from fake in terms of all those thought picks. I think people really wanted to support, you know, what he was saying. And they were also, I mean, we do have some folks on Twitter, of course, not me, who can be a little thirsty. (laughs) (laughs) Well, one of the things now in the aftermath of this story and Darko being exposed, people are going to be saying, well, I've already seen on Twitter that we were catfished. Tennis Twitter were duped, all this stuff. But there's there's a bigger underlying issue here as to why people wanted to believe Darko in the first place. And I think first and foremost, for my timeline at least, is within the context of this sociopolitical climate in North America and the fact that there's so many, to be frank, shit American tennis players 
in terms of their political views and their lack of support of women's tennis. And even more than that, the ATP just, there's so few players who support women's tennis that this was, this was a breath of fresh air. Oh, right. I mean, it's, it especially, it especially was um, when you have, we don't even have to bring the names up, but these American male tennis players um, who are usually on the alt-right position and supporting this all sorts of shit to have somebody who's refreshing, who is supporting someone like a Venus Williams, like a Serena Williams, someone who is supporting the um, gay rights and gay marriage. So Darko was doing that and it was refreshing and it was nice to read. And it was, it seemed a little too good to be true, but it still felt good to know that someone might have been out there that was feeling this way and that was speaking up for what actually was decent. Isn't that crazy? Like, we were so desperate for that. Because there are really, aside from Andy Murray, of course, nobody in men's tennis who's who are saying things like that. Liam Brody has been pretty good lately. That's true. Yep. Man, so who is Darko? Who is the gentleman in the videos? Apparently there was this guy from Spain that was, his videos were stolen for a couple of them. Because the, the if you read the article, the picture, the guy in the video who is actually Darko from way back when is not the guy that we've been seeing. Like that mm. guy is not the one who was thirsting up Twitter and Instagram. That's not the same person. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, I saw that like, that looked like a bootleg clip um, in that article. And it was not the same person. So he definitely was catfishing us. Um, I think it probably would have been pretty easy for someone that may have access to talk with him and interview him to get that information. Um, but folks just, you know, were not in that level to ask. Mm. Um, well, to give you some credit, he tricked the BBC, but you knew from the jump that it was fake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I once again pat me on the back i like that <laughs> <laughs> now something that maybe you have been you may have seen happen live while you were at the fed cup matches jill smaller was going off on twitter on a lot of folks one of them was ben rothenberg and in part of their exchange you know ben was like well you know if you can reply to me here on Twitter, you can reply to my texts. And in the moment, it's like, oh, oh dear. Like, uh, where, where is that coming from? But then it seems like Ben tried to contact Jill for this article. And it's written in there that Jill Smoller had no comment. <laughs> <laughs> so a, bit, a few of the pieces of the puzzle from Tennis Twitter the last couple of days coming together. The thing, I mean, when I talked, Jill was, like I said, very gracious, very kind to offer those seats. She also talked to us a little bit um, about 10 minutes time after one of the matches. And some of Rena's army were in, you know, those seats. And they basically said, you know, we're here for Serena. We don't like to Serena, see Serena get dogged out. We don't want to see her unjustly you know, crucified for things. And Jill responded and said, this was Saturday. She basically said, I don't like people coming for Serena regarding how quickly she's back on the court right now and about her body and about things that may take time at this point to get back to where she needs to be. She said that on Saturday. Um, and I agree with her. And we, I mean, pretty much Rena's Army was like, we feel you. And that's what we do. You know, Rena's Army basically will defend Serena to the hilt for everything. But for these types of things, that's definitely what Jill was talking about. That folks don't need to bash Serena for how quickly she's coming back on the court. And if she's gained a little weight or if she's a little sluggish or just shut up. And then the next day after the matches, I didn't see Twitter as, you know, things were going on. But then to see Jill was 
you know, in fully, full outright attack, not attack mode, but calling people out rightfully for things that were said about Serena during that doubles match. Serena didn't perform at her peak. I don't, ex- I mean, nobody should expect that. Um, but then to then see those tweets after that. Um, it's good to have Jill in your corner. A little queasy feeling. <laughs> Man, Jill is, she is like the most loyal auntie you've ever had. You know, <laughs> like, I want her on my side. Don't be fooled by the sweater around her neck. She's not some prim and proper little white lady. <laughs> she can I get down him, in these told, Twitter streets. Said, right, she did. She said that. She said, I will get it down and dirty, but it's, it's sort of to defend what is right. Mm-hmm. Um, it is not defending Serena for just any and everything, but those are the things that she pointed out. Side note, I told her my Twitter name, and <laughs> which is CC Smooth. Thirteen. And she said, she said it's okay, honey. What? What? What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> I basically was trying to say that this was a, a Twitter name that was given, you know, sort of came from high school and college. Uh-huh. And, and um, she just basically said, it's okay. And she said, that's pretty much it. I don't know what that really meant, <laughs> but it was sort of funny and it's all right. So you're saying Jill is the shade queen. Yeah, I mean, she's a little shady, <laughs> but she's also was pretty much, if you're on Serena's side and if you're on the side of defending what is right, when it comes to Serena, we're good. <laughs> and she's on your <laughs> What All do right. you guys think about what do you guys think about that interaction that occurred, if you don't mind my asking? Mm. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm really I agree with you completely. I, obviously I've been a Serena Williams fan for really almost as long as you've been a Venus fan. I appreciate that she has an agent who who is really down for her 100 percent, and will defend her and i'm glad you gave us that insight about she's being really defensive about serena's body and people who would criticize uh you know her for going back on the court too soon or criticize the way she's playing it's good to know that about jill i i mean sunday like the timeline just exploded jill really just reach for that wig she got her fingers in there and she just snatched it right off like she had no mercy yesterday and you know as a messy person myself i can really appreciate that and given <laughs> <laughs> what are you laughing about <laughs> nothing I, nothing at all <laughs> given the context that you just gave in terms of what jill is particularly protective about it makes sense then that she would be apt to come for ben's wig after the body issue article that was written a couple of years ago, right? Mm-hmm. It seems like maybe she's holding uh, something residually from that. Once again, it goes back to when I was sitting there live. I was so grateful to see her on the court. And I don't know if that's just the live experience that made it more sort of just, I, I was just full of gratitude just to see her out there. Um, and I do think it's a little bit lost on TV, but we need to remember that as much as Serena has done superhuman things, she will do them again, but just let her have some time to get there. Chad, I think that's a great place to end. We don't want to keep you all night. Thank you so much for your insight and for coming on the show. Um, before you go, let me just plug your social media for a minute. So Chad is on Twitter at ccsmooth 13 He's also on Instagram at the same name. And also his tennis photos are at CC snaps 13. So Chad, thank you so much for coming on. Have a good night. Thanks, Chad. Thanks guys. Thank you to Chad for coming on the show. And let's wrap up this episode with a little bit more of a discussion about the Darko situation. So we touched on it in our conversation with Chad, but God, it was such a bombshell, right? It's not like it's really a shock that that this is fake news. Like, there were always weird things about this account. He never showed his face. Um, like, his tweets were a little bit too earnest. 
I almost, for a while I thought maybe this guy is real, but he's just has really weird social skills. I think folks, myself included, just wanted it to be real. Mm-hmm. In spite of what our gut instincts told us. Because really, <laughs> nothing about it screamed legitimate. <laughs> no. Really? <laughs> Seriously. That's true. The thing that was confusing was, okay, you know, Chad told us, like, I think this guy's fake a while ago. And I kind of laughed. and I'm like, okay, maybe you're right. But then he said, like, oh, I signed with Adidas Tennis. And then Adidas Tennis tweeted back at him yeah. and said, welcome to the family. So I was like, okay, why would they do that? Uh, were they confused too? Or did someone running their social media just think, oh, I guess, I guess we, uh, you know, he endorses us. So uh, we'll just tweet back and say, hey. And he has a check mark. And he has all these followers. He did have a check mark, but I mean, like Nazis have check marks. No, but what I'm saying is mm. that could be one of the reasons why Adidas maybe just did that. Right. If they somebody was like, asleep at the wheel. Yeah. Because you see somebody who says they're a professional tennis player, who has a check mark, who, if you do like a cursory scroll of their their page, you know, Martina Navratilova is inter- interacting with right. him. Uh, Serena Williams follows him. Like, his profile has been up there recently. Mm. What you and I have been talking about, and and it's come up quite a bit this afternoon on Twitter, is uh, uh, people were were looking for someone like him. Like, he's not real. We know that now. But we were so desperate for a men's tennis player to be conscious, to to have positive opinions on women's tennis, LGBTQ people, like, we were searching. It wasn't even like, you've said this before too, oh, he's the woke player, you know, people refer to him as woke bay mm. kind of thing. It's not that he was so enlightened. It was that he was exhibiting thoughts and ideas that what we think are the base expectations from folks. Mm. And that, <laughs> we get none of that from ATP players. Outside of Murray or Liam Brody has been saying stuff lately. That there's such a paucity of players who espouse even remotely socially conscious ideas. Yeah. I mean... Made us susceptible to be like, well, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn the blind eye here. Like, he's mm-hmm. not playing tournaments, whatever. Let him go practice. If he does come of something, he's probably not even going to become anything, you know? Right. But let's, let's, uh, let's not quiet this voice in the discourse. And that's where I think there is some utility from the Darko experience <laughs> in spite of all uh-huh. of this, right? Because it did shine a light on that dark side of the ATP. Right. And I mean, when people, when he came for Margaret Court and when he was he, tweeting in support of Serena Williams, like people were here for it. And I don't think that anyone should be ashamed that they fell for it. No. Right. Because like, we're not detectives. We're not investigative journalists. Like on Twitter, a lot of people are just here to have fun. And it's hilarious that he's fake. It is so funny. Like, <laughs> I am, I will be eternally amused by it. Like, he has scammed everybody. Mm-hmm. And for folks to be like, oh, y'all are fucking dumb. Like, I have no room for that in my life right now. <laughs> like, people have jobs. Like, people have other things that they worry about. They're not trying to, like, expose a catfish on Twitter. They just saw some tweets and liked it and retweeted it. Like, it's not that serious. Like, Darko was the medium, the mule, for these thoughts being put out into the Twitter sphere. But those thoughts are still legit. He may Mm -hmm. be false Mm -hmm. and fake, (laughs) but those thoughts still mean something. And in that way, Darko is real. (laughs) That's very postmodern, you know? (laughs) So rather than focus on Darko and 
maybe trying to hunt him down, find out where he is. Unless he stole money from folks, those people are Adidas. If you cut him a check, you're more than entitled to go hunt him down for that. Well, I mean, who's dumb? <laughs> no, but still, like, unless he took money from you or abused you, like, mm-hmm. blocking you on Twitter is not cause to be like, go hunting this dude down now. Right. <laughs> you know? And how many, how many catfish, is it catfishes? Catfish. Catfish. Cat. <laughs> how many scammers are entirely good natured in their fakeness? Right. Right. Like, where is like, the harm that like, came out of this? What is? But what is this person getting out of it? Yeah. Because by spreading goodwill. <laughs> because also, what what was the goal here? Was he trying to? <laughs> he said he was going to play all get wild cards into all these tournaments this year. Like, right. you got to show your face to do at that. At some point, you got to play at some <laughs> point. Was this just someone having fun? Or were they, trying to, like, were they trying to get money? The coma thing is one thing, but then say your mother died and that's why your progress right. is delayed. That, right. was, that was really bad. I mean... That was really bad. And he was trying to get on Ellen. I don't blame him. Like, Ellen is out here cutting checks to every old white person in the world <laughs> for, like, some basic stuff, right? So I don't blame him trying to get money from Ellen. My point in wrapping this up is unless there is some harm or deleterious deed that Darko enacted upon you, (laughs) the focus here should now be pivoted to the ATP. And there's still lack of... Let's call it an empathy gap. Oh, yeah, that's a good way to describe Mm -hmm. it. Like, we still have Isner's out here talking about how his alt-right heroes clapped back at somebody on Bill Maher and it was amazing. (laughs) You know, liking tweets like that. That There are so many seemingly innocuous ways in which these ATP players continue to muddy the discourse in a way that is harmful to a lot of people, Mm. right? And so unless you have some great harm that Darko caused you, you know, let's run with the good that he was able to bring to the discourse. <laughs> That's my glass half full oh, take on this situation. I like how we're still talking about him like he's a he. Like he's a person. <laughs> it could be Darkisha. I don't know. <laughs> or it could... <laughs> it's, it's hilarious. Like I am so amused by it. But you, you get my point. I do, right? yeah. That brings us to the end of episode 111. I'm sure there will be more Darko tea to come. Yeah. We'll catch up with you in another episode. I'm Jonathan. You can find me on Twitter at tennis underscore John. And I'm James at Elliot JMR. Two L's, two T's. And find us on Instagram at the body serve on Twitter at the body serve. And, uh, you know, write us a, a review on iTunes. We appreciate it till next time. <laughs>